Go. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm the program coordinator at the Saltmarsh Senior Center. I'd like to welcome Arthur, elder law attorney, who today is going to talk about asset protection versus tax avoidance. Thank you so much, Laura. You're thank welcome. you very much for inviting me back to the Salt Marsh. It's great to be back here, and thank you for coming. Um, my name is Arthur Bergeron. For those of you who don't know me, I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us there, 40 in Worcester and 20 in Westboro. Because we're a multi-specialty firm, everybody gets to do just what they like doing, and I like this. I do nothing but elder law. Um, and I've been coming here, I think, to the Salt Marsh for six years. And so folks realize I, what I try to do in these presentations, some of them are very general in orientation. I try to do an Elder Law 101 every year. And, but then I try to get to some more specific topics. This is a topic that comes up a lot in my practice. My median age, the median age of my clients is 74. Um, most of the folks that I'm talking to have got two kinds of concerns. Uh, they want to make sure that they are minimizing their, their tax burden, and they want to make sure that they don't get killed if somebody goes to a nursing home. Um, my, my standard couple that you've seen me talk about before are my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And they're, they've got a very simple goals. They've got, been in their house forever and they want to stay there until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. When Frank dies, he wants to leave everything to Mary. When Mary dies, she wants to make sure that things get liquidated and divided up among the kids. Very basic estate plan. Um, so that's what their positive plan. Um, the other side of their plan is what they don't want to put into their, into their estate plan is they're not, they're not got nothing in their will that says, I really want to leave $100,000 to the IRS, you know, or to the nursing home. I love the nursing home. I'm just going to leave them some money, or to Mass Health. So one of my goals is to make sure that the money goes where it's supposed to go and that we minimize this kind of leakage. And so, um, but sometimes when you're trying to minimize these costs, there is a conflict between your attempting to save um, money that would otherwise go to a nursing home versus to save tax money. And that's really what this presentation is going to be about. We want to be talking about those places where there may be a rub there and where you may be needing to try to evaluate which one of those things is really, really the most important to you. So to start off, I'm just going to talk about Mass Health 101, which we've discussed here before. So that this is kind of the baseline. Um, if, if Frank and Mary are both alive and, and uh, Mary goes to a nursing home because she has a dementia or some other reason that she needs to be in a nursing home for more than 100 days, then Medicare or her health insurance is not going to cover it. So she's going to need to qualify for Mass Health, which is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, unless she wants to pay privately, which at our island home I think is around $14,000 a month. Um, so in order for her to qualify for Mass Health while Frank is alive, um, she needs to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank, on the other hand, because he's still alive and at home, can own the house itself as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000. That is not a problem most places. It is a problem here, of course. Uh, and by the way, if you're over that $828,000 in the value of your house, remember that says equity. It doesn't say fair market value. So for folks that are over that number, the kind of the standard ways to deal with that typically is to get a reverse mortgage, pull out some of the, of the value through the reverse mortgage, thereby dropping the equity number below 828,000. In addition to the house, Frank can have cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $119,220. But most importantly, Frank can have infinite income, infinite income. And so the kind of the oftentimes the package, the easy package to get Mary qualified for Mass Health in this case, and she can qualify right away, even though they've done no advanced planning, is to shift all the assets to Frank, um, ha and therefore the house is safe because it's got an equity of less than 828. Um, have Frank take all of the money over, say, $100,000 and buy an annuity with it, thereby converting this countable asset, which pushes him over $119,000. 220 to a non-countable income stream because Frank can have unlimited income. Now, there may be kind of an, 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 as an investment, this is a terrible investment. The annuity that, that you, Frank would be buying will pay about 1% in interest. And so it, 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 you're never buying these because you're, you're, it's a great investment. You're only buying them to qualify for Medicaid. If you call the insurance companies and want to buy one of these, they tell you what they're called as a marketing matter is Medicaid qualifying investments. That's the only reason why you buy this annuity, right? So if, if Frank and Mary are in this situation asset-wise and they've got a house and it's worth 300,000 and Frank has an IRA worth 150 and there's an annuity worth 100 
and they have bank accounts worth 100, so their total assets are worth 650. This strategy makes a lot of sense because there are very few negatives to this. While, he, while he's going to be you know, reducing probably his return on his annuity, uh, and, and, um, that's, that's a factor. His IRA, he's going to be able to convert into one of these Medicaid qualifying annuities without it, it causing it to be a taxable event. So he's not going to have to pay the taxes on the IRA when he does this conversion. Um, so he isn't losing a lot. <clears throat> and what he's gaining is that from the day that Mary is on MassHealth, instead of paying the nursing home, the private pay rate at the nursing home, say that that's $14,000 a year, she's going to be paying them $750, $750 a month, right? The nursing home, excuse me, $14,000 versus $14,000 a month. She's going to pay them $750. And MassHealth is going to pay the rest. Um, and none of these assets are going to have to get spent down, and they're not going to be lienable by MassHealth following Mary's death. So that's a good strategy in this situation. But suppose instead that they had those assets. Suppose Mary's, suppose the house is worth $400,000. Suppose they have a cottage. Or suppose they're in Nantucket, and so they've kind of got a house and a cottage, right? They have a house that they live in, and then they rent the cottage. Um, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this example with a house and a cottage, but think to yourself if that's your situation as if it were a house and a cottage. Um, and Frank's got an IRA of $300,000 now. He's got more money, but Mary's got one too. She's got an IRA of $200,000. Uh, there's this annuity that they've got, and it's earning a reasonably good rate of return, but now it's $200,000. And say they're earning 4 or 5% on that annuity, so they're probably getting about $10,000 a year in income from the annuity. Um, so they've got savings. Now their total value is $1.5 million. So in that situation, and, and by the way, for purposes of this comparison, and I should have warned you at the beginning, there are going to be a lot of numbers in this presentation because we're trying to compare money. We're trying to figure out what's the best financial strategy for someone and try to, to compare the savings regarding nursing home versus the costs regarding, a lot of times, taxes. So I'm sorry up front. It's going to be a lot of math. If you get really bored, you know, you, got to, you can fall asleep. <laughs> I don't mind, right? So we're going to assume that this is their income, their regular income. So they've got, Frank's got his Social Security coming in, 2000 a month, 24000 Mary's got hers, half of Frank's, 1000 uh, a month, 12000 the cottage that they're renting out is making $10,000 a year net. Um, Frank's IRA is paying a required, he's got his required minimum distribution of $3,000. Mary's is $2,000. And the annuity, say, is making him $4,000 a month. So that's a really low number on the annuity. So his, their income is $55,000. Now, when they're trying to decide whether they want Mary to qualify for Mass Health and whether they want to do this asset restructuring, same asset restructuring, shift all the assets to Frank and have him buy an annuity. They want to figure out, they want to compare that to what their other effects are going to be. Income taxes, capital gains taxes, which are a form of income taxes, right? Uh, and the estate tax. Um, so we're going to talk about each one of those. What do Frank and Mary need to know? They need to do this income analysis. They need to compare, for example, the fact that, th that their income is going to drop by turning all of their investments from investments that may be making 3 or 4 or 5% to an annuity that's making 1%. Um, and then, and, and remember, they're going to lose this income from the cottage because in this example, they're going to need to sell that cottage because the cottage is, is a countable asset. The house wouldn't be a countable asset if it was worth less than 828, but the cottage would. Um, They've got to look at what they're going to lose on their annuity, both if some of those assets are taxable, right? If, if, if some of the money in the annuity is deferred money, they're going to have to pay a tax on that. There may be a withdrawal penalty. Mary's got to look at what's, what it's going to cost her to, to surrender her IRA and pay the taxes up front for that. So a lot of these questions really involve doing a tax analysis. And we're going to talk about that. Once again, those are their assets. First, we're going to talk about income taxes. Um, you just, this is a little primer. This is like 101 on income taxes. It's going to relate to the sale of the cottage a little bit later on. So income taxes, here's how they work. And I know that you, you may know all of this. I, tip, I didn't. I mean, you, you know in general that the federal income tax structure is that there's a graduated income tax. And what that means is whatever your income is, that the federal government divides it into, into little pots. And regarding each pot, you pay 
uh, a percentage in your income tax. And, and the higher up the pot is with your income, the more the tax. So the way that system works, and you've got this in your hand now, that's the system. So if Frank and Mary had no deductions and no exemptions, because if they did, it would get too complicated. If they had no exemptions uh, or deductions, and they were earning $55,000, what would their tax be? Well, the government would first take their first, remember they're married filing jointly, so all the dollars between zero and 18,000, the federal government's gonna tax them at 10%. Not a really high tax rate, right? The dollars between 18 and 75,000, the government's gonna tax at only 15%, right? Now remember, Mary and Frank are only making 55,000, right? Uh, so their, their total tax is going to be low. We're going to talk about that. But note, once the income goes over between 75 and 150, the tax rate's 25. Between 151 and 230, one, the tax is 28. Above that, the tax is uh, 33%. Now, the reason why that's significant is that if, if something big happens in this particular year so that Mary can qualify for Mass Health, if she, for example, surrenders her IRAs, uh, which were worth $200,000. She just increased their income that year by $200,000. And so that year, their income is $255,000. If they sold the cottage that year too so that they can qualify for Mary, Mary for Mass Health, that means their income is two fifty-five dollars plus the three hundred dollars of the cottage. Now their income was $555,000 that year, which means a lot of money may be getting taxed at higher rates except for capital gains, and so we're going to talk about that, okay? So Mary and Frank's income tax at $55,000 with no exemptions. The first $18,000 gets taxed at 10%. Remember, we went through that. The, next, the rest of the money, the money between that and $55,000 gets taxed at 15. dollars And so their total tax is $7,300. The Massachusetts income tax, we're going to round it. We're going to say that it's always 5%. It's not exactly that, but otherwise it gets too complicated. So that's how the income tax system works. Are we okay on that part? Any questions? Okay, now capital gains. We all know, we've all heard of capital gains. We probably know what capital gains are. A capital gains tax uh, is the tax on the capital gain. What is a capital gain? It's the gain that you make if you bought something cheap, you kept it for more than a year, and then you sold it for more. And how much is the gain? Uh, in the, and so, for example, what if Frank and Mary were going to talk about their house first and then the cottage? Um, what if, because what if they, what would be their gain? Well, the gain is the adjusted sales price minus basis. Adjusted sales price means what you sold it for minus the costs of selling it, like in the case of real estate, the commission, the lawyer's fees, all that stuff. Um, and so it's that amount, which is what you sold it for, minus what, you, what basis, which kind of in theory is what you bought it for. So it's the purchase price plus the cost of any major improvements that you made to your property if it's real estate, right? As to what is a major improvement that, that gets added to basis versus a minor improvement, talk to your accountant. I get confused on that, but, so that's, but that's that. So, so it's, it's adjusted sales price minus basis and minus depreciation, and we're gonna talk about depreciation a little bit later, yes? Is basis the number that existed when you, the instant you bought the house, or does it mean? Is the, the, the basis number? the amount that, that is the, it's the amount that you bought the house for. That is correct. It's the amount that you bought the house. It doesn't change unless you made these big improvements, in which case that gets added to basis. Or unless you've been renting the house out and you've depreciated the house, in which case that gets subtracted from basis. And we're going to talk about that. So the federal capital gain, and then once you've got that, Figured, that, figured out the capital gain, the federal tax on that is around 20%. It's a little bit higher than that. If you, it's a little bit lower than that if you make very little. It's a little bit higher than that if you make a ton. We're going to use 20%. The federal and the state one is about 5%, once again. So we're going to use, in our numbers here, we're going to assume that your capital gains tax is 25%. Okay? So if Frank and Mary want to sell their house, and it's worth $400,000, and they sell it for $400,000, and they get $400,000 because they had no commission and no, no legal fees or anything because that's simple to do it this way. Um, and if their purchase price was $30,000, this is not an uncommon situation, right? You've got folks here that the purchase price, you know, kind of ratcheted up, might have been a couple hundred thousand, and now it's worth a million and a half, you know? But it's, it's, for people who've had property for a long time, this is a not, these, for my clients, this isn't unusual. 
The purchase price was 30,000. If the improvements that they did, they added a room, they did something, were 20,000. Total basis, purchase price plus improvements is 50,000. 400 minus 50 is $350,000. That is their capital gain. Do they pay a capital gain tax on that? Well, not if it's their home. If it is their home, then each of them gets a $250,000 exclusion from that capital gains tax, right? Now, it's their home if they have lived in it and owned it for two of the last five years. The reason why I say I emphasize the, the live and own is there are a lot of people who will, in order to protect the house, either to avoid probate or to protect the house for mass health purposes, transfer an interest in this house to their children and keep a life estate in the property. Um, and that all works fine for mass health purposes in that, in that five years after that transfer has been done, that interest that they gave the kids is no longer counted for mass health purposes. So there's an incentive for doing it. And it avoids probate because when, the, when they die, their life estate evaporates, it instantly goes to the kids. And so now there's no probate. The problem though is uh, if they don't need nursing home care, but want to sell the house, and they want to get the capital gains exemption, well then a couple things have to happen. The kids have to give them back their interest in the house that they gave the kids. So you've got to hope that the kids are going to give it back to you. And then after that, they have to live there for two more years, right? Because you've got to have lived in it and, and um, um, you have to have lived in it and owned it for two years prior to the day that you're going to be trying to qualify. That's a little piece of trivia. So in this case, though, it, they've done that. They've been living there for 30 years. Um, sales price was 400,000. Basis was 50. Capital gain was 350. If this was not their home, the capital gains tax would be 25% of that 350, or $87,500. Since it is their home, the tax is going to be zero. Now, a couple of other trivia things which, which are relevant now and later re, re, uh, regarding basis. <clears throat> Technically, when Frank and Mary bought their house, they each got, and they owned the house together, they each got half of that basis. Frank had ba a basis of one half of the purchase price, and Mary had a basis of one half of the purchase price. When the improvements happened, if they owned the house together, they each got half of the basis for the improvements. So remember the total basis was, was, uh, was $50,000? Well, actually, for capital gains purposes, if you want to sort it out, Frank's basis was 25, and Mary's basis was 25. Now, when you die owning a piece of appreciated property, whether it's a stock or, or real estate, your basis in that property jumps to the date of death value. It's called stepped up basis. It's magic. And so if Frank dies, then his basis in his half of the house jumps to the date of death value. So if Mary then goes to sell the house, here's how the numbers work. She sells the house for $400,000. The original basis was $50,000. Her half of that basis was $25,000, and it's still there. His half of that basis jumped up at the date of death value or stepped up to one half of the value of the house when he died. And if that value um, was $400,000, then his basis jumped to 200, meaning that Mary's basis when she goes to sell the house is to now $225,000. The 200 that she got from Frank because the basis stepped up in her old 25, meaning that her capital gain would be $175,000. Her exemption, remember she has a $250,000 exemption, is two hundred fifty, dollars and therefore the tax is zero. The reason why I wanted to go through this though was pretend the house is worth $800,000 now. Well now the sales price is $800,000, the basis numbers, um, her numbers stayed the same at twenty five. dollars His basis that jumped up was half of that $800,000, which is four. Total basis is now four twenty five. dollars Capital gain is three seventy five. dollars Remember she gets an exemption of two fifty. dollars which means there's a remaining amount, 125,000 that's subject to tax. So when she sells that house, she's gonna sell it for, a there's gonna be a capital gains tax, $31,250. Um, I'm going through that just because here, these kinds of things are really relevant the, because the, the difference between what people bought stuff for here and what they're worth now is often gigantic. So I'm gonna mention another piece of trivia here. Say Frank owned the entire house when he died. Frank, say Frank owned all of it instead of half of it, right? Well, look, in that case, the entire basis went up to $800,000 when he died. 
Mary sells for $800,000, she pays no capital gains tax. There is no capital gain. Okay, see how that works? Um, what if Peter, Paul, and Mary inherit the house? Same thing. Well, now we're going back to the old house. Say the house is worth $400,000, basis is four, basis just stepped up to $400,000. Kids sell the house, pay a zero capital gains tax. So Frank and Mary have a really good reason to not want to sell that house if they don't have to, because if they give it to their kids, especially if there's a, been a big appreciation in the house, the kids don't pay any capital gains tax. Now, in the back of some of your minds, because you know, this is a popular conversation here in Nantucket, because everybody's house is worth so much, that the numbers seem to, everybody seems to go over a million dollars. So people are thinking, but isn't there an estate tax problem here? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. But for capital gains purposes, you wanna hold on to your property right? Um, you want to hold on to your house, you really want to hold on to this cottage, right? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Now we're going to talk about depreciation recapture. Raise your hand if you've heard of depreciation recapture. Zero people here. That's about the same number that I've gotten at most of the seminars. So depreciation recapture. So if you own, this, this relates to Mar Frank and Mary's, their rental house. So if you own property that you're renting out, the income that you get is income, right? That's rental income. Except that you only pay a tax on that income amount minus your expenses, right? And minus depreciation. The theory behind depreciation is that um, the asset that you have reduces in value every year by a little bit because it got older. Of course, that really doesn't happen in the case of real estate, or it hasn't for a long time because of where we are. Values keep going up. But that's how it works. So if you are renting out your property or a piece of your property, then regarding that piece that you're renting out, um, if, you, if you've got income, you take your income minus your expenses and minus the amount that you've taken in depreciation in that year, and that net is what you're going to pay income taxes on, right? And, and, and that depreciation, without going into the details, if Frank and Mary have had that cottage for 30 years, they have now depreciated that property down to zero. They have depreciated their basis down to zero. So, say that Frank and Mary had bought that cottage 30 years ago, and they put a bunch of improvements in 30 years ago, right? So their basis was their purchase price of 100,000 plus the improvements of 100,000 for a total of $200,000. And say they've rented it out every year, and so in the course of that, they have depreciated the property down because each year they've taken a percentage of that $200,000 as depreciation. And because of that depreciation, they've paid less in income tax, right? Because they only paid income tax on the rent minus the expenses minus the depreciation. And so their current basis is zero. So for a long time, um, uh, what you would do is, you, one of the reasons why you'd buy rental property is you could depreciate the property down and therefore take all this depreciation and, and save all of this tax money, income tax money, but then when you get to sell the property, you were selling it and you were only paying a capital gains tax. So you were making, a, you were making money just because of the accounting, because maybe you were depreciating it and you were in a 33% bracket, so you were saving 33 cents on every dollar, but when you paid the capital gains, you were only paying 25%, right? Well, eventually the government picked up on this and changed the rules and said that regarding property that is being depreciated, that piece of the sales price when you go to sell that is attributable to the amount that you depreciated it by, that piece of your gain, you don't pay the tax at capital gains rates. You pay it at ordinary income rates. So in this case, when they go to sell this cottage worth $300,000, remember the adjusted sales price we're gonna say is the whole 300,000. Basis was zero now because they had bought it for 100 and you put in 100 in improvements, but they depreciated that down to zero. So their basis is now zero. Their, the capital gains tax only applies to 100,000 of that $300,000 sale price, because the rest of it is all recaptured depreciation. Remember, they had, their basis was 200,000. Purchase price was 100, improvements were 100 for a total of two. They depreciated that down to zero. So that $200,000, they're going to pay tax on at, at ordinary income rates. And um, remember, their annual income before they did this was $55,000, right? So the highest marginal rate that they were paying was 15%, which, 
but oh look, um, they're selling this cottage for $300,000. Take 200 of that, right, and say that that's just being taxed at ordinary income rates. Um, the first little chunk, $20,300, that's the amount that gets them from their, their other income of 55 up to the 75,003 where they're only taxed at 10%, sorry. The next piece, 76,000 um, up to uh, 103,000 gets taxed, the next $76,000 gets taxed at 25%. The remaining $103,000 out of that 200,000 gets taxed at 28%. So regarding that piece of their gain, they're paying $51,000 in federal tax. Regarding the remaining 100,000, remember that extra 100,000 over the, the 200 that they had done the recapture on, this, they're only paying at the straight capital gains rate of, 25, of 20%. So, so they're paying 51,000 on the ordinary rates, they're paying another 20,000 in capital, federal capital gain, the state capital gains tax, remember, is 5% on everything, over another 15,000. So their total tax when they sell this cottage is $86,000 out of the $300,000 in proceeds. Now remember, uh, if they both die and leave that property to their kids, the kids pay zero in capital gains tax, right? So they've got this big, big incentive to not sell the cottage and transfer the, all of the money over to Frank and have Frank go buy this big annuity. Right? Because they're going to they're going to spend a boatload of tax money that they can totally avoid as long as they hold on to the cottage until they die. Right? So that's one of those things that they really need to factor in to this equation of whether or not they want to do this. Um, and, and by the way, if Frank were to die, and just Mary was selling the property, this is what would happen. Remember, Frank's oh the sales price would be three hundred thousand dollars. Frank's basis, remember his stepped up basis. Um, goes to 150. So now the, all the equations that we just did would only apply to the other $150,000. So there's a good reason to be trying to hold on to this property, right? By the way, this is the reason why um, if you've got a separate property that is a cottage and when you're doing this kind of mass health planning, a lot of times that's the asset that you want to transfer out of your name into an irrevocable trust and wait five years so that you can avoid be, being stuck in this trap where if one party goes into the nursing home, you have to sell the cottage, right? Because it's not your house. Um, if they both die, once again, there's no tax to the children. So by the way, once again, in the back of your minds, when you're seeing this, you're saying, oh, but um, the, the, you know, what, about the, what about the estate tax? Because if Frank and Mary have got assets of, of this amount of money, isn't there a big estate tax problem here, right? So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the estate tax, right? So we did income tax. And we did capital gains, and everybody still looks like they're awake. So I'm just going to do a little bit about the estate tax. So you just get the concept of why typically the benefit from um, holding on to the property, having it go through your estate, and therefore getting that step-up basis outweighs the benefit of avoiding the estate tax. Okay? So the Massachusetts estate tax, like the federal estate tax, was created, I think, in the 1920s. Uh, during an uh, era very similar actually to this era where there was a big concern about large accumulations of wealth, right? People making a boatload of money um, and, and then passing it on because the general sense was if you make the boatload of money yourself, you should keep it, but why do the kids get to get it all? So they, they, they adopted estate taxes, except that at that time, $40,000 was a lot of money, it was considered to be a lot of money. And so they, they adopted uh, when they created the estate tax, this estate tax chart, this is the Massachusetts estate tax table, um, the original one, and it's still in effect. They've never changed this table, okay? So according to the table, oh look, if you have an estate, a taxable estate worth more than $40,000, you're paying an estate tax. Not a lot. As to the dollars between forty dollars and $90,000, you're paying eight-tenths of 1%. It's a graduated system, though. As to the money between ninety and one hundred forty thousand dollars, you're paying one point six percent, and so on and so on. Go to the line that has a million in it. Between eight hundred and forty thousand dollars and a million forty, you're paying an estate tax at five point six percent, right? So by that time, it's up to five point six, and it continues to go up, but relatively slowly. So even if you've got an estate that's worth a million five. Um, 
the tax that you're paying on some of that money is only 6.4%. So you're looking at this table, and, and so a tax, the estate tax on an estate of $2 million is, is 103000 On Frank and Mary's estate, the entire estate tax is only $68,240 on an estate of $1,500,000. So you're thinking in your mind, but I thought that if you had an estate of less than a million dollars, there was no estate tax. And that is true. Because what happened historically was that at some point, the legislature woke up to the fact that everybody's real estate went up in value. And so everybody was paying an estate tax. And so I think it was in the 60s, for the first time, the legislature came in and said, we're going to deal with this. Um, and the way they dealt with it was they said, if your estate is worth less than a particular amount, which I think originally was $60,000, you paid no estate tax, right? And then it went up to 100, and then it went up to 500, and now it's a million dollars. And so if your estate is less than a million dollars, your taxable estate, you pay zero in estate tax, which then leads to the question, but what if your estate is worth a million and one dollars, right? Then what happens? Well, in some states, like Rhode Island, until a couple of years ago, uh, if that happened, they had the, the estate tax was referred to as a cliff tax. Um, their magic numbers uh, that you didn't have to pay a tax was like $650,000. But if you were a dollar over, you fell over the cliff, and then you had to pay the amount that would have, you would have had to pay using their chart in Rhode Island, right? Massachusetts didn't do it that way. Massachusetts said, when you go over that million dollars, um, they, are going to, they were going to gradually recapture that money that they lost with that first million, right? So when you're over a million dollars, the tax on your estate is the lower of 40% of all of the dollars over a million or the amount that you would have gotten if you did the table, okay? So for example, if your estate is a million dollars, using the table, your tax should have been 36560 but we don't tax anything that's a million dollars or below, so your tax is zero. It's the, that's the lower number. If your estate's at a million one, million one hundred thousand dollars, your tax would have been forty two thousand six hundred forty. The tax, if you're paying forty percent of all the dollars over a million, is forty thousand dollars. The lower one is forty thousand dollars, and so that's your tax. You get to a million two, that's where the change happens. The exact change happens at around a million one hundred twenty-five thousand. If you get to a million two, the tax according to the table is $49,000, 4940. The tax, if you're taking 40% of all the dollars over a million, is $80,000, 40,000 or 40% of $200,000. Um, the lower is 49,040. So from then on in, you're back to the table, right? And so finally, the tax on a million five is 68,250. If you were doing 40%, of, of uh, the, the amount over a over million dollars, the tax would be 200,000, right? So the tax ends up, once again, you're back to the table. So the, the estate tax, if you're an estate of a million five, it exists, right? But the total estate tax is very, very, is very small, right? Compared to what you may be saving in capital gains taxes by having this, this basis step up on your properties. So in general, as far as Frank and Mary are concerned, what they're trying to balance is certainly if Mary qualifies for Mass Health and she's at the island home and her income is only is in this case $750 a month, she saves about $13,000 a month in nursing home costs by being on Mass Health. If she qualifies for Mass Health because Frank and Mary have done all of these things and now bought this long-term annuity which is paying them 1% a year and now they've got this tax bill of $86,000 on the cottage. Um, and they paid the taxes on the IRA that Mary had to cash in in order to move her money to Frank, right? They didn't save any money if Mary dies after a month, if Mary dies after two months. Their cutoff is around if Mary lives more than a year in this particular situation. And I guess what I'm trying to illustrate is that when you've got, ask, when you've got te possible tax hits and these lo losses in income because you're changing investments from 4 or 5% investments to 1%, you need to kind of figure it all out. You need to kind of take all these things into account and try to balance these things out. And um, in many cases, you need to kind of make a guess. You need to say, well, 
in this case, how long do I think Mary's going to live, right? Because the average stay in a nursing home, or the median stay, rather, is less than two years, right? So if you don't think Mary is going to live a long time, and there are all these other costs to restructuring, well, then you don't want to qualify for mass health. She could. Mary could always qualify for mass health. Always, always. But the question is whether this other stuff outweighs it. Similarly, if you are doing, if Frank and Mary are coming to me and they're saying, well, but we're both feeling pretty good right now, you know, and everything is fine, but we're worried about this in the future, right? Or especially if, if um, Mary is single, and so they no longer have this option that if Mary goes into the nursing home, we can shift everything to Frank, right? And so she may be saying to herself, well, the only way I can protect some assets is by transferring them out of my name and waiting five years. So when they're doing that, for example, if they gift the cottage, if the Frank and Mary just gift the cottage to their kids, um, then when the kids go to sell the cottage, when you make a gift of appreciated property, you're giving the person you gave it to your basis. So Frank and Mary, if they get the property gifted to them as opposed to inheriting it, they get Frank and Mary's basis, which is zero, right? They go to sell the cottage. Remember, we did the analysis. Most of the gain resulting from the sale gets taxed at ordinary income rates, which means the wealthier the child or the higher the income of the child, the more they're paying in taxes on their piece of that property. So if they gifted that property to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., thinking that they were each giving them, giving them each a third of the property, they really weren't. Because when Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. go to sell the property, after taxes, Mary Jr. makes a lot of money because her tax, rates are her tax rate is low. Frank makes very, or Peter makes very little because his income tax rate is really high because he makes more money, right? So there's that to consider. Um, we talked about this. You could transfer your property to your kids and retain a life estate in the property, in which case, once again, the benefit is when you die, the tax basis is going to jump to the date of death value. You only want to do that, though, if you're sure, sure, sure that you're not going to move, that you're not going to need to sell the property. Because if you do, then you've got this problem that they've got to give it back to you, and you've got to wait two years, right? Uh, or you can transfer this interest to the kids and retain it to a, an irrevocable trust, but a trust which, you can, which your lawyers can structure for you to make sure that for capital gains purposes, if you turn around and sell the property, you're, not, you're still going to be able to use your exemption. So there are strategies that are available to you. Which one is better? Um, to figure that out, and I'm going to pass that one. Uh, that's, not, that's boring. Uh, I'm going to mention one other thing before I say which one is better. Um, Nantucket and the other island, um, in those two places, before about 2000, a whole bunch of people were sold on doing cuprits with their property. QPRT, Cuperts, or Qualified Personal Residence Trusts. The theory behind the Qualified Personal Residence Trust is it was a mechanism to avoid the estate tax. Uh, what you would do is you'd create this trust, and the kids or uh, the trustees for the benefit of the kids would be the trustees. The older people would transfer the property to the trust. There'd be a given period of time during, uh, or, or during which they would, they, they, would, they would not have to pay any rent because they would keep like a life estate in the property. And after that time, they need to start paying rent um, to the trust at, at regular rates. But the reason why they went through that whole exercise was at the end of the exercise, the trust it owned the property. The property had been gifted to the kids. There hadn't been a gift tax involved. And when, the, when Frank and Mary died, or when the older people died, the property didn't get included in the estate. That was extremely important before 2000, back when the federal estate tax applied to estates that were much smaller, like estates of about a million dollars, because the federal estate tax rate is really high. But since then, um, the federal estate tax has become kind of irrelevant. The federal estate tax now only applies to a taxable estate of more than 5.4 something million dollars. And if you're a couple, and you die and you don't use your exemption, it goes to your spouse. So that when that spouse, the second spouse dies, their exemption is $10.8 million. So the federal estate tax has become irrelevant. So the real question is whether or not is the Massachusetts estate tax. But remember, the Massachusetts estate tax is very small. So having the property, you know, for example, you know, I've seen, I, I recall a case you know, where I've got a, there was a property with a tax basis 
because the property had been inherited of about three or $400,000. And the current value of that property is a little over $3 million. Um, and and, and, the, and the, the children in this case had gotten this property through one of these cupids from their parents. So now the kids own the property. And it was great that when the parents died, it wasn't part of the estate, except the kids go to sell this property now. The capital gains tax on the property is the difference between the $3.2 million current value and the basis, which is about $400,000 or $300,000. So the estate, the capital gains tax is going to be on about $3 million. And the rate, remember, is about 25%. So the capital gains tax is going to be about three quarters of a million dollars because the property was in the Cooper. Right? The reason why I mention this is there were a lot of people on this island who still had these cupids, who, who shouldn't, who shouldn't. Uh, if they keep the cupid, they will have avoided the estate tax. But as a result, if they're, unless their kids are staying here and they're planning on living in the island, right, when those kids go to sell that property, they're going to pay a boatload in taxes, a boatload in taxes. So these folks really need to look at... Um, you really need to look at trying to unwind that cupid. You can. Having the kids maybe gift the property back to the parents so that when the parents die, the basis in the property is going to jump up to the date of death value. I just wanted to mention that because it's important here. So when you're trying to figure any of this stuff out, don't just ask your elder law attorney. right? Don't just ask your accountant or your financial advisor. You need to talk to all three of these people. People regularly ask me for financial advice. I tell them, no, no, you're asking the wrong guy. I don't know what the best investment opportunity is for your asset. I can't do that analysis, right? I can tell you how mass health works, right? I, I can't tell you your tax stuff. I, we, we have lawyers that can, but you may just want to talk to your CPA. But the point is, if you're trying to decide whether it's pre-crisis planning, whether to do, to do asset planning ahead of time, or there's a crisis and you're trying to decide whether you want to qualify for mass health, because you always can, you need to talk to all three of these people. It's really important. And they need to be talking to each other. You don't need to be the emissary that is calling the accountant and having the accountant say, oh, that's going to kill you for taxes. And then you call your lawyer back and you, the lawyer says, oh, but that's going to save you all this money for mass health. And then your investment person says, oh, the, you know, they need to all be on the same call. Okay, uh, if, I know this was really pretty dry, <laughs> um, and, and, but if you really want to see it again, Frank and Mary have their own uh, um, uh, YouTube channel called Elder Law Frank and Mary, so you can watch this show again. Also, thank you very much to um, Nantucket Cable for being here and for being willing to rebroadcast these shows, because a lot of times people that can make it during the, can't make it during the day because they're working or whatever. Thank you very much. Any questions regarding any of this? I know we covered a lot of stuff. And it was pretty dry. No questions? Well, thank you very much. If you have any questions individually that you want to ask me after the presentation, I'm around. Otherwise, thank you for coming. Happy holidays, and I'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.